Welcome back to Small Caps, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Kerry Stevenson, and I've asked Tiger Brown to come back and chat to us. Tiger is the Managing Director of Astron Corporation. Their project, the Donald Project, is down in Victoria, and it's rare earths and zircon. But it's not just a rare earth zircon project. It's kind of globally significant. It's big, it's advanced, and the numbers, because they've just come out with their DFS, which I want to talk to you about, but the numbers are astonishing and i'm just wondering if the market has completely woken up to where they're at with it tight capital structure uh not a lot of shares on issue um but they're doing the work tiger great to see you thanks for joining me on small caps today thanks for having me carrie now the donald project that's that is it isn't it it's a single focus project down in victoria zircon rare earths very well advanced and last week you were, you published the dfs so I think, because I spoke to you a couple of months ago. So guys, if you want to hear about the, sort of the background, go and watch the previous interview I did with Tiger. Today, we want to talk numbers. So let's talk numbers around the DFS that was, um, as I said, announced last week. Yeah. Last week, we announced a definitive feasibility study for phase one of the Donald Project. The phase one is based on the mining license area, which covers 17% of the project's total mineral resource. Yet financial analysis showed an MPV of $852 million post-tax over its 41-year mine life. It's expected to generate over $13 billion of revenue and $4.3 billion of free cash flows over that same period. And it's keep, important to keep in mind that that will be the first phase. Um, and we plan subsequent phases uh, to capture more value over time as we get this thing ramped up. I think you mentioned zircon and, and rare earths. I mean, rare earths is certainly the buzzword today. But despite all of that, it's the underlying financials that really, I think, makes this a, a financially attractive project and, and investable from, from that perspective. Yeah, because uh, 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 it's interesting you said rare earths, and I, I want to come back to the numbers again, but before I do, lots of companies out there, Tiger, talking about rare earths, they've got a rare earth project, and then they, they, they get a bit of excitement around it. Um, you've got a very, you know, you, you've got a tight capital structure, as I said before. Um, there's rare earths and there are rare earths, if you know what I mean. Like, there's a basket. What's What makes yours different from all the other ones out there? Yeah. It's fascinating. I mean, the rare earth market is growing at a rapid pace. Uh, Atomus Intelligence, the, glo the global leaders and sort of consultant and advising this space, forecasts the rare earth demand to be growing at 6% per annum until 2035 as part of this drive to EVs and electric vehicles and, and wind turbines and renewables. Um, to fulfill that gap, there's many projects, but there's not that many projects as advanced as we are. Um, we are the most advanced project of our type in the Eastern Seaboard in terms of rare earths of Australia. And all in addition to that, we're also one of the largest rare earth projects um, outside of China. And as you know, China dominates the rare earth supply. And we could really represent an opportunity to be an independent value chain as uh, the Australian Critical Mineral Strategy has delineated in recent times. So that's the rare earth proposition. But, but, first... but hang on a second, with the rare earths, because there's rare earths and there's rare earths, what, what rare earths do you have that make this important in the supply chain? Yeah, and in addition to, well, there's different types of rare earths. There's cerium, lanthium, and it's a series. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> and there's many, many elements. Um, for us, the rare earth product that we produce contains significant neodymium and perosium, the two that's used in electric vehicles, mainly, uh -huh. and not just those two, but also the heavies, the dysprosiums and the terbiums, which makes this not just a typical rare earth concentrate, but one that has a higher value compared to what you would usually compare on a monazite basis. The heavies that we have in terms of our product or anticipated rare earth basket mix and the rare earth concentrate product will be the, will contain the most, the highest number of heavies uh, when we compare to our peers. Um, and uh, dysprosium and terbium are used in electric vehicles to increase the temperature tolerance of these magnets. 
So you can run them at 150 degrees instead of running them at 50 degrees, um, which is, again, a very useful thing in an electric vehicle. This might sound like a really dumb question, but I'm going to ask it anyway because I'm not a geo or a mining type person, but how do you do a DFS on rare earths? Because isn't the processing quite challenging and quite complicated? Yeah, absolutely. And that's why we've decided to phase our project. For us, we know that there's refineries being built, such as the one out west no, with Iluka. Arafura is progressing in their refineries, and we have refineries being built in the US and, and in Europe. For us, what we want to position ourselves is just to sell a concentrate product as a sweetener with our heavy rare earth mix and our light rare earths, of course, but with that heavy component and selling it to these refineries who go through the chemical processes um, and take it in through to the rare earth oxides. Okay, so, you, so so what you're doing is you, we'll just do the concentrate. We won't go into the complication of the processing side of it. Yeah, and everything that we've done in this feasibility study is really about de-risking the project. Um, in terms of the processing that we're planning, it's some, it's conventional, proven, and established techniques. In terms of the mining, it's truck and excavator mining. Again, proven, conventional, and established mining techniques. Um, everything that we have done um, in our first phase is just to de-risk this. And the same with our product mix, as we've talked about today, is you know our product mix is the rare earth concentrate and the heavy mineral concentrate. We'll leave the processing to, to someone else in the first stage. Okay. We'll just get into cash flows. I mean, for us, when we look at an investment proposition, we look at the speed, the time to cash flow, and that's something that we're certainly focusing on and 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 then de-risking the project, and that's what we've done with the FISO. With this feasibility, talk to us about what's that timeline look like? Yeah. Now that the feasibility study is delivered, I suppose the, the, the real fun gets it's, – it's, it's exciting now. Um, it's about the funding, the offtakes, and the finalisation of the approvals. Yep. We're, we're targeting FID quarter one next year, uh, which would have approvals, offtakes, and, and so forth already lined up. And then it will be an 18-month to 21-month construction period. So first shipment of products, quarter three, 2025. Um, we're currently doing offtake discussions at the moment, and we expect to update the market mid this year. Okay, so the offtakes are not there yet, but that's what you're working on. Um, <clears throat> the 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 mine life itself. This is a big project. Um, it's zircon and rare earths. In that DFS, it was that across rare earths and zircon, or was it just the rare earth element? No, it was across both. So revenue is made up by the two products that we intend to produce uh, in terms of the heavy mineral concentrate, which will contain the zirconium and titanium minerals. Okay, and then the rare earth element concentrate, which will contain the rare earth minerals, which is the, what we've talked about earlier, the neodymium, dysprosium, terbium. Prosium. All those names I can't pronounce. All those names, yes. <laughs> um, and over, we are anticipating circa sort of 350 million Australian dollars of revenue per annum over this phase one mine life. Wait, say that again, over phase one, what was it? 350 million dollars, Australian dollars, circa, a per annum in revenue per year. Okay, and that's revenue. What's your what's your bottom line off that? What's your cost looking like? Yeah, we're looking at a gross margin of about fifty percent. So oh. revenue to cash cost ratio of two to one. Wow. And over forty one years, that allows us to have the ability to weather business cycles and really see out commodity pricing cycles and so forth. I mean, this is significantly de risk in that sense. With that de-risking, one of the things that people always look at is where are you going to send your product to? Who are your offtake agreements with? Do you think that's a hurdle that the market's waiting for you to, to get over, if you like? Yeah, potentially. But I would like to um, sort of point to the market dynamics of these products. Um, or mentioned earlier, the REF demand is forecasted to grow at 6% per annum with really limited new sources of supply to fulfill that demand gap. And not many, in that sense, not many new projects coming along the same timeline as we do. So we don't 
feel personally there's any risk, well, as a company, any risk in getting the offtakes. It's just about stepping through the process in the rare earths front. The other part of the product mix, the zircon, um, 35% of the world's zircon is anticipate, supply is anticipated to come off in the next five years. Um, and and that provides a, a gap, well, a, a gap for the market where new sources are needed to fulfill that gap. Um, and we could, and again, and that's another reason why we, we're not feeling um, nervous about offtakes. We talk to our customers on a day-to-day -day basis. It's really about taking the project through a methodical step, delivering the feasibility study. These are the product mixes. These are the volumes. And then carving those up into offtake agreements. Um, one of Astron's strengths have been our market presence. Um, Astron was fun, founded in 1980s, and we've been in the mineral sands market for over 30 years. Um, we talk to customers still on a day-to-day -day basis, and it's really, from an offtake perspective, just stepping through, you know, getting a long list, getting a short list, getting term sheets, negotiating term sheets, and finalizing them into completed offtakes. And that's what we're doing now. Okay, that's that's the offtake side of it. Here's here's the big one: how to fund it. What are the talk to me about the numbers of you know because you've done the DFS. How, how do you get to the next stage, which is getting this into production? What do those numbers look like? Is it debt? Is it equity? What's it look like? What's the costs around that? Yeah, so we're looking at a capital expenditure upfront of three hundred and sixty-four million dollars. Um, which will mean we'll need to raise circa 450-ish over basically to cover all working capital and allow for escalations and so forth. Um, we're thinking about a debt to equity mix and progressing uh, of circa 60%, between 50 to 60% debt. Okay. Um, when working with debt advisors at the moment and um, we're, we're looking to appoint a debt advisor in a reasonably short period of time to cover the debt side. Uh, and that will leave us about a $200 million equity funding component that we'll need to, to cover off and all options on the table. Um, from our perspective, we're looking at a dual sort of focus in terms of the ECM market, uh, shareholders and funds and so forth, as well as the strategic market. Um, and we know the strategics like this and like the project because frankly, the market dynamic as we've talked about earlier, Kerry, is the way it is. So, yeah, that's our, that will be our focus and getting the cash flow to get this going, uh, getting the cash to get this going, and um, we're, um, we're on our way. Okay. Um, I'm just looking at, you know, at the moment you've got about 130 million shares on issue, so it's tight. Um, would you look at potentially getting a joint venture partner in to help you with the funding of this? In other words, instead of going out to market and raising that, let's call it 200 mil out of the 450, <clears throat> would you look at just bringing in a strategic partner that that needs this product, like one of the offtake partners, for them to fund it? Yeah, all options are on on, on the table, definitely, Kerry. And from, from our perspective, we'll look at it um, as how we best provide value per share to our shareholders. Um, if it makes more sense for the shareholders to go down the strategic pathway, then certainly that's if the option comes around and, and that's what we'll do. What are the next steps? What's the news flow? I'm talking to you in May of 2023. What's the news flow for the rest of 23 for Astron? Yeah. So the next thing should be the off tax really as, um, as the key next step. And we're expecting that mid this year, discussions are advanced um, and we'll, we'll keep moving on that front. Um, we're looking at the submission of the final regulatory approvals. We have the EES in place and Victoria, which is EIS everywhere else. But the one final step is the work plan, which is mining management plans and, and other jurisdictions. So we're targeting submission of that in quarter three this year, um, which, and then I suppose the, the financing process of, of getting this through and FID quarter one next year. So. <laughs> Where lots, is it in, in Victoria? <coughs> Excuse me. Got a tickle in my throat. <coughs> Where is it in Victoria? Have you got any challenges around environmental? Because that's what people always sort of worry about a little bit. Yeah. 
it's located in the Wimmera uh, region, sort of 300 kilometres northwest of Melbourne. Uh, it's currently cropping land and not many native veg, not many trees. Um, yeah, and we don't see there being major environmental concerns with this development of this project. We've set aside in our mine plan native vegetation areas and we're certainly allowed for an offset as according to the EES regulations that we've been set. So, um, no, it's been farmed for over 200 years and um, and we'll put it back to farmland after we've, after we've mined it. Okay, that was going to be my next question is, are you working um, in, in lockstep, I guess, with the farmers? You know, if this is cropping land, how do you look after them? How long, you said before, it's a 41 year mine life. That's a generational uh, mine life. So what happens to the farmers? Do you buy the land off them or, or how does that work? Yeah, one of the big advantages that we have in mineral sands mining is it's not an open hole that stays open forever. Okay. We dig it up, uh, we stockpile the topsoil, subsoil, overburden all separately. We deposit the tailings back and then we put a back with overburden, subsoil and, and then topsoil right back on top. And then we rehab it back into farmland within basically whatever we dig up, we rehab within three to five years and we, we send it back to its original land use. So whether if it was a farm before, we put it back to farms. If it was um, a, a vegetation patch, which there, to be fair, there are not many of those in, in where we are, but if that is what it was and we excavated through it and then we'll put it back into that. So um, mineral sands mining is truly low environmental impact in that sense. But are these are, are, are the the people that have got this land, these farms around there? Are they pro what you're doing? Yeah, we talk to. I go I go out there every six weeks or so, and I talk to them on a regular basis. Um, we don't take our social license to operate lightly, um, and it's one of the areas that we continue to to to, to work on and communicate and operate on a, a, a sort of a open communication basis. I think one of the things that Personally, I'm really proud of in terms of the, what we've achieved as a team is maintaining that strong community relationship that we've developed. Um, last year, we did a refresh, refresh of a memorandum of understanding with our local Shire Council, and we're putting that into use um, around finding solutions around housing. You know, how do we get workers in the area? Um, I mean, infrastructure investments such as power and water are actually mutually beneficial because this is an area that that has been underinvested in for a while and and this project hopefully brings and helps that infrastructure need and, and helps it grow and, and, and gets it growing again. Has it been tough out there for the farmers because I know that you know in Australia some of the farms have been doing it really tough from a from an economic point of view. Do you think that this project ultimately could help when you rehabilitate the land could make actually, improve the area even more it, i'm just wondering how they're doing it out there yeah i think they've had a couple of good years it's been very rainy down our way there's obviously been there's actually been floods last year so yeah that's true depends yeah. on where you are within the the paddock some have had it really hard and but some have had it reasonably all right but the thing is farming is in that set in that area is sort of there's good years and there's bad years and they will realize that, you know and having this mine be there as a stable source of revenue not relying on the rain or not relying on yeah, the okay. weather really i think that's what the farmers see as the first first part and the second part is you know farmers have kids and they go into the cities and they don't come back because there's no job opportunities and we hope as this mine could provide that opportunity um to, to the local region and, and we're looking at adding 150 jobs directly through us and having a, a, a impact of probably circa 536 full-time equivalent um, when you when you do all up. So okay. it's a huge operation in that sense in terms of um, compared to the local region. And we well, look forward to reporting yeah, there's, there's certainly big numbers. Now, I just, before we wrap it up, because we're running out of time, one of the things you said before was this is phase one, which is only 17% of the project. Is that correct? Yeah. And there's further duplication opportunities to come. 
um, this project size and scale is truly significant. Um, it's the largest zircon project globally, the third largest rare earth project outside of China. And as a result, you know, even phase one supports 41.5 years of mining, but we can extend that moving forward and, and duplicate and, and further even duplicate just to, to keep things moving. Um, yeah. Where's the product going to go then, uh, Tiger? Where, where's the product? You just said uh, it's the largest project outside of China. Are you sending the product to China or are you sending it to the US? Where, where's the product going? Or is that, Kerry, I can't talk about that yet because we don't have the offtake. Well, we're, we'll work through our offtakes and I hope to report back to you. All right. Okay, look, it's a massive, massive project. It does sound like um, it's important that you keep that local area apprised of what you're doing. Sounds like you're doing that. Um, wrap it up for me, if you could, Tiger. Last time we spoke, you talked about the size of the project. You talked about the fact that there was advanced test work and approvals, and you said that there's supply deficits for both. I guess I'm going to leave it up to you why you think right now it's an even better time for people to sit up and take notice of Astron. Yeah, I think really it comes down to the financial propositions now. We can speak to the NPVs, we can speak to the cash flows. Uh, the project demonstrates robust financials um, with NPV of $852 million um, over the phase one life and room to further grow um, through subsequent phases. And that's the first, that's the real key point. And then second point is the timetable to cash flow, cash flow generation. We're looking at cash flow generating in 2025, uh, quarter three. Um, so that's that's sort of the points that really just the financial proposition of this project. Yes, it's rare earths. Yes, it's mineral sands. Yes, it's some markets that are in need. But underlying economics is what, from my perspective, supports the growth in, in Astron as we move forward. Well, it's a big project. I can see that you're very passionate about it. It is one of the largest globally significant ones. I wish you all the best. Come back. Uh, maybe when you've got those off-take agreements, come back and let us know. But ladies and gentlemen, as, as uh, Tiger just said, this is just the first phase. This is phase one, and those numbers are pretty big, but you can find out more on their website or why not reach out and talk to Tiger himself. But congratulations on all the work you've been doing. We look forward to chatting to you in the near future. Thanks so much. Thanks, Kerry.